Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, The Expanding Role of Diagnostic Next Generation Sequencing in the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Microgen Diagnostics. To learn more, visit microgendx.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I now present today's speakers, Dr. Joseph F. John, Low Country Infectious Diseases and Affiliate Professor of Medicine, Medical University of South Carolina, and Dr. Michael G. Schmidt, Professor, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Medical University of South Carolina. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. John and Dr. Schmidt, you may now begin your presentations. Good morning. I'm, I'm Dr. Joseph John, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on next generation sequencing and the clinical microbiologist. I'd like to thank Microgen Diagnostics for sponsoring the program. Here to discuss the basic technology of this revolutionary activity is Dr. Michael Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt is a professor of microbiology and immunology at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. Dr. Schmidt has had an illustrious career as a basic and applied microbiologist. Many of you may know him best for his biweekly podcast, This Week in Microbiology, sponsored by the American Society for Microbiology. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Schmidt. Thank you, Dr. John, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. First up, uh, we're going to get through the normal rigors of a scientific presentation, namely the disclosures. And both Dr. John and I are members of the Scientific Advisory Board for Microgen. And again, the opinions are those of the authors and not necessarily those of our employers. The learning objectives for today's presentation are pretty much straightforward. And we hope that each of the objectives is met and that they give you something that you can use in your clinical practice or in helping the clinicians make appropriate decisions. There are three that we're gonna cover first, the limitations inherent to traditional microbiological cultures and why next-gen sequencing may offer you an opportunity to help in your diagnostic matrix. Secondly, how clinical specimens evaluated by next-gen sequencing techniques can aid in making clinical decisions. And finally, how you can practically evaluate information from the next-gen sequencing reports that are provided from you from our sponsor, Microgen DX, in order to assist you in your decision matrix for the care of patients. So we're gonna start with a problem. Many of us in the clinical microbiology world have seen this often, and those who are treating patients struggle with this. This is the case of a sterile pyuria with persistent urinary white blood cells, but negative standard urine cultures. The patient is literally presenting with the symptoms of an infection, but as best we try, the clinical laboratory is unable to reveal the culprit microbe. I'm going to hopefully convince you today of the value afforded by that coincident culture as well as next-gen sequencing in order to aid you in understanding the microorganisms that are present in a particular specimen. So the challenges and limitations of culture are many, 
Many of you are well familiar with them, and I have just selected a few in order to highlight. One of the first that I want to call your attention to is less than 1% of the known microbes will grow in traditional culture methodologies that we routinely use in the clinical laboratory. Anaerobes, as you well know, are extremely difficult to grow and often are inhibited unless you're specifically caring for them, whether or not you're using anaerobe transport medium, whether or not you have the appropriate facility in order to culture anaerobes. And one of the other aspects is if the patient is coincidentally infected with a fungus, the fungi can take over 20 days to generate a result, and oftentimes they require special media. This makes it very challenging for the clinician. The clinical limitations with culture, I'm just going to sum up, Less than 1% of the microbes identified can routinely be grown in a clinical laboratory. And what we know from the literature for one particular recalcitrant type infection, that is periprosthetic joint infections, in up to 50% of those infection cases, cultures fail to isolate the infecting microbe. And oftentimes we now know from the literature that those infections are often polymicrobial and as a consequence of a biofilm-based infection. The clinical end result, of course, is negative cultures have been associated with about a four and a half fold increase in a risk of reinfection when compared to a culture positive test. So consequently, this impacts on how well the patient will respond to your treatment course. And again, as I mentioned just previously, many of these infections are polymicrobial that in fact influence your choice of antimicrobials that you may be wishing to treat the patient with. Enter the persisters in viable but non-culturable cells. These are variants for normal cells that are tolerant to antibiotics and are responsible oftentimes for the recalcitrance that we see in our patients towards the treatment with common antimicrobials. Much of this work in the field has been pioneered by Dr. Kim Lewis, who is a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University's College of Science. And approximately 0.3% of the microbial community responsible for an infection may be, in point of fact, persister cells. To give you an idea or back of the envelope calculation, if you have a density of about a billion organisms per mil, approximately 3 million of those microbes are in a persistent state. What this means is the cells are refractory to antimicrobials. And as the antimicrobial is diluted out of the patient, these microbes can revert and grow. And we know 3 million organisms are a significant presence and they do indeed cause problems. I've placed on this particular slide two references that you might find useful. We have transitioned our thinking about the importance of persister cells into this next concept of viable but non-culturable and how they can be perceived as persistent cells. They effectively are a consequence of stressors that are applied to the microbial community. And this concept of viable but non-culturable or more frequently abbreviated in the literature as VBNC was pioneered about 40 years ago by Rita Caldwell's group in describing this observation in Vibrio cholera. We now appreciate that any environmental stressor could send a community into this culturable but still virulent state. And in a seminal paper published by Professor Bill Keeble from the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, Keeble and colleagues actually describe how viable but non-culturable cultivars of Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella enterica, Cerevar Thompson, are actually induced into this VBNC state simply by being exposed to a very low concentration of sodium hypochlorite principally in the realm of three to 100 parts per million. To give you a frame of reference, this is often 
the concentration of bleach that is routinely added to the wash water that are ready to eat produce is so often washed with and sent for us to consume. So this concentration of the strong oxidant hypochlorite can send the microbe into this B, B, and C state. But remember that strong oxidants are a routine of our natural immune process that our systems use to rid us of microbes. So the stressors of our immune response may actually send part of the community into this B, B, and C state. So let's take it back to the clinic. The consequence of B, B, and C to the clinician and to laboratory stewardship. Now, these chronic symptoms of an infection with seemingly no known cause really drive the provider crazy because the patient is demanding to know when they will get better. They are prescribing antimicrobials, which of course impact on your antimicrobial stewardship budget. And the microbe is probably just ignoring the drug that you are providing to the patient. Secondly, this sterile pyuria with this persistent urinary blood, blood cells are actually indicative that the patient is still having an infectious response. But the standard negative urine cultures are suggestive of something more complex, such as tuberculosis, or whether or not it may be a V, B, and C state that has been induced by the antimicrobial or in point of fact, the patient's own immune response. So the fundamental question before the clinician and the clinical laboratorian is when or do you even reculture? So now here's where I sort of try to transition into offering you the value proposition afforded by culture in NGS testing. One of the first questions that you need to ask yourselves is if you're going to send this out or if you're going to do this internally is can you do it what types of specimens is your laboratory proficient in remember the types of specimen are as varied as the number of infections so again you have to ask the question can the lab do it secondly are they proficient microgen dx has been uh validated by the College of American Pathology over these past many years, and have, they have been submitting uh, over a thousand blinded specimens, and they have a mean accuracy rate in determining the identity of the unknown at approximately 99.2%. The third question you need to consider is how fast will you get the results back, whether it be from PCR, if you happen to be doing that internally, whether it be a full NGS workup that you're sending off-site, how quickly can you get those answers back? And finally, this third concept of the resistome. These are the antimicrobials that are resident in the community. Recall that many of these recalcitrant infections can be polymicrobial. So the microbes may actually have a resistance profile or the community to many antimicrobials. So the resistome is effectively asking what antibiotic resistance traits that have clinical relevance are present in the patient's specimen. And finally, there's the stewardship issues, both laboratory and antimicrobially. From the laboratory perspective, uh, the cost for the microgen approach is less than $300 per specimen. This will, of course, lead to better outcomes if you identify who's there and you develop a treatment profile. And as well as by identifying the organism early, you'll have a better handle on what antimicrobial to prescribe, which in turn will affect your antimicrobial stewardship budget. So it's a win-win on these four points. So now we're going to describe for you this three-step process that your patient specimen takes upon receipt at Microgen. 
The first thing is you, the provider, makes the order. You select the specimen, you collect the specimen, and then you send it off to Microgen. The first thing that happens upon entry, and this is effectively at the nine o'clock position on the slide, they isolate the nucleic acid. The nucleic acid is then split into three parts. The first part is submitted for 16S ribosomal gene uh, characterization. This is a very rapid step, and generally within 24 hours of receipt, you will actually know who's there. The second piece of the nucleic acid specimen is submitted for next-gen sequencing in case any of the PCR primers that were originally selected for the level one analysis failed to identify or simply weren't present in the NGS specimen. And finally, the resistome. We'll have more to say about that when we get to that particular point. But now I want to focus on the 16S ribosomal um, RNA gene process that has been optimized for patient specimens. And those of you who are familiar with 16S, this is old hat. And generally, a primer pair is selected. Generally, where you see the loops, or as I call them, the cul-de-sacs of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, this is what is subjected to genetic drift. And this is what enables us to use the 16S RNA gene as a sentinel molecule to identify the microbial world. Again, Microgen is using specific primer pairs for the organisms most likely to be present in your clinical specimen in order to identify quickly. Remember, this is a diagnostic that is principally trying to answer the question of what is present in your patient specimen. This technology in the database has been developed over the last 40 years. It was originally pioneered by uh, Carl Woese and Norm Pace. And of course, it's now ubiquitously used by microbiologists to characterize unknowns as well as known microbes. So this happens to be our urine sample. Then these are the particular primers that you are seeing. This is an evidence-based approach based on a continuous survey on behalf of Microgen, asking the question, what are the most likely microbes present in urine? The primer pairs that are used to amplify up the DNA target are in a constant state of revision and validation. And the PCR results you need to appreciate are dependent upon the proper primer set being present and tailored for your particular specimen type. The trade-off of this is it's a very fast technology, but the downside is it's limited by the DNA concentration, which is in turn based on how well the DNA is recovered from your patient's specimen, which is dependent upon the quality of the DNA, the quantity of DNA present, and of course, it's limited by primer bias and whether or not the primer is even present. So take, for instance, if you have a fugitive microbe, one that normally isn't associated with the target specimen like urine, if a microbe is my, microbe that is normally not characterized is present, uh, what are you to do? And that is where the level two comes in. So let's first look at the level one report from our urine specimen. This urine came from a, a female patient, and you can see that we have identified from level one two microbes, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we have a concentration estimate of how much DNA is present, about a million copies per milliliter of patient specimen. And we also have Enterococcus faecalis, which was present at a lower concentration, approximately an order of magnitude less. Again, this is dependent upon the primer set that was used. And if you recall from the last slide, both Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Enterococcus faecalis were primers that were present in the cocktail that was used to evaluate the urine sample. But oftentimes, 
a urine sample can actually fail PCR and there are no bacteria present. And so you fundamentally need to ask yourself the question, is this a case of truly sterile pyuria? But don't worry, your specimen was split. The nucleic acid was split at the time of receipt and it has been working in the next gen sequencer, effectively asking the question, who is there? So again, what could account for the negative results? Again, the same limitations that we talked about previously requires the proper primer set. The trade-off is good, it's fast, but the downside is DNA concentration, the quality and quantity of DNA, and again, primer bias. What if that microbe was a fugitive? So absence, again, is but part one of our analysis, but again, appreciate that your sample is still in progress with the next-gen sequencing machine. And so that takes us to the level two. Again, your nucleic acid has been submitted. It is undergoing next-gen sequencing. And let's look at the level two report. Again, we see that Pseudomonas and Enterococcus were indeed identified by the next-gen sequencing approach. But in addition, we find that in this urine specimen, we have three additional microbes. We have E. coli, Bacteroides fragilis, and Enterobacter luigi. And what you see in the rightmost column is the percentage that the nucleic acid represented in the next-gen sequencing profile. E. coli was, in fact, the largest amount of nucleic acid recovered and sequenced from the NGS sample. And in point of fact, E. coli was the predominant organism at about 57%. Again, B. Frag was 28%. We see Pseudomonas still in there, but it only represented 5% of the microbe present in this particular polymicrobial patient specimen. Enterococcus faecalis was in the weeds, and it didn't represent a significant mole fraction of the total nucleic acid present in the next-gen sequencing approach. Now let's look at the negative specimen. This again is a negative urine specimen. And while it was negative by PCR, it was not negative by the next gen sequencing. In point of fact, the microbe that was present in our negative specimen was Aerococcus. And then it was followed by some minor players, Peptomnophilus and Actinogesium. And those organisms are indeed present. Now, again, why was the PCR unable to detect it? And more importantly, why was culture unable to detect these microbes? And again, we now know that the nucleic acid is indeed present at a significant fraction in this particular patient's urine specimen. This takes me to our third aspect of the information that will be revealed from the patient specimen upon submission, and that's namely assessment of the resistome traits present. Presently, this is a PCR-based approach using an informed, using a literature-informed choice on the resistance genes screened. Again, the resistance genes are based on the literature looking for which genes are going to impact the treatment decisions made by you, the provider. And if you're not familiar with the concept of the antibiotic resistome, I'll call your attention to this excellent review in Nature Reviews Microbiology by Gerald Wright. He describes in detail what the resistome is, and it's really nothing more than the set of genes that the community has. And in fact, when we look at the introduction of ant widespread introduction of antimicrobials back in the 1930s with the first sulfa drugs, we appreciate that the microbes have adapted and are literally destroying the antimicrobials in our armamentarium. And in fact, as we add new antibiotics to our formulary, 
the microbes are, of course, adapting. And in 2018, we added three new antibiotics to the list. And of course, we are continuously looking to assess whether or not the microbes will develop a genetic resistance trait in order to get around our antimicrobial. Currently, Microgen is actually screening for 17 genes that are clinically relevant. They are listed for us in the middle right of this particular slide, and they are the genes that you would anticipate. And in fact, what you see at the red arrow pointing, we again have our unculturable, unPCRable, but next gen sequencing result for urine. What you see is that this particular specimen was indeed had resistance genes for methicillin, a broad class of beta lactams, quinolones, and Bactrim. So now you, the clinician, need to make an informed decision at what is the best antimicrobial in order to clear this polymicrobial infection. And this is effectively what our next-gen sequencing report looks like. Again, the antimicrobials Microgen has listed for your consideration. You are the ultimate decider of which antimicrobial to preside, pre prescribe for your patient. And Dr. John is going to go into this in greater detail during his discussion about how you make these informed choices. So this concludes my portion of the talk. Summing up, I hope I've introduced you to the value of the rapid 16S ribosomal RNA approach to discovering who's there. But short of that failing, at the same time, your specimen is still, still being processed through a next-gen sequencing approach, and you will actually know who's there. And finally, the third piece of information that you'll get from your single specimen is whether or not the microbe is indeed resistant or has any resistance traits present in its genetic makeup so that you can then make the best informed decision to help your patient. So Dr. John is gonna take us to the next aspect of our discussion here this morning, and that's the clinical rationale in support of the value of coincident culture and next-gen sequencing. And he's gonna specifically address these three points and so without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph F. John Jr., who is a member of the Low Country Infectious Disease uh, Practices. And Joe has had an even longer and more distinguished career as an infectious disease practitioner than many physicians, and he is well adept at understanding the nuances associated with these polymicrobial infections. So Dr. John, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt, for that introduction. And thank you very much for your excellent presentation uh, to give us some understanding of how this revolutionary technology is being used and applied. Let me start with my first case of, of two cases that involves a prosthetic joint infection of an 83-year-old man living in senior housing, but he plays golf every day and is extremely active. He had a total knee uh, uh, arthroscopy 15 years prior uh, that resulted in a left TKA. And in the last 15 years, he actually had two revisions of that. His orthopedic surgeon was then totally unwilling to do any further surgery. Uh, unfortunately, he developed new joint swelling, warmth and pain uh, with weight bearing. Uh, and the, uh, the synovial uh, tissue was in fact inflammatory. Uh, the surprising thing is that from a culture, an abiotrophy of species grew. Uh, and at that point, I received a consultation uh, uh, to give my opinion of this patient. So luckily the orthopedist was <clears throat> very flexible agreed to do a second joint aspirate, which was sent uh, for next-gen sequencing. And I'll just briefly go into the fact that the result of level two NGS at microgen revealed an ibiotrophia defect 
defectiva, um, which had um, uh, had previously been described in very few prosthetic joint infections. In fact, uh, this was the fifth one. Uh, and in your reference list, an article by Tolley, T-O-O-L-E-Y, uh, will uh, amplify one of the one of the four cases that have been described uh, in the literature. Because there's a variable antimicrobial susceptibility with this organism, and because we had no direct antimicrobial susceptibility, uh, I chose to treat this patient with two grams of IV ceftriaxone uh, for uh, multiple weeks. At about three weeks into uh, therapy, the patient, in fact, and he was taken off uh, of the IV antibiotics. And at that point, uh, we had to make a mutual decision. Um, it turned out that the patient was very reluctant to undergo further intravenous therapy, uh, wanted an IV antibiotic, and he remains right now uh, on oral uh, uh, clindamycin. Um, it's very interesting. I spoke to him very recently, and he's gaining strength uh, every day in that uh, knee and is able to weight bear and walk with his walker uh, right now. The second case for consideration is a uh, young 26-year-old lady uh, from the Midwest with a history of, um, of ear piercings uh, dating to the point in time uh, when I saw her. In February of this year, she had a right upper ear uh, piercing to put uh, another uh, uh, piece of jewelry into that. Uh, and she did well for several months. Uh, but about two months after the piercing, uh, she began to drain uh, from the uh, uh, inner pin aside of that uh, piercing. Uh, and that material was sent for a normal culture, but only was reported back from a commercial laboratory as having scant normal flora. She underwent further courses of several beta-lactam uh, oral antibiotics and then was referred to me for further uh, consideration. Uh, we immediately thought of doing a next-gen uh, sequencing of this uh, material uh, it had to be expressed slightly, and when it was done, you can see the results of the next-gen sequencing level two uh, at the right-hand side of your screen. Now, I know that some of you are going to be surprised that a few of these organisms may not be even recognizable to you, uh, but I guarantee you that all of them have been described uh, with human infections. I won't go into detail uh, into all of them, although Dr. Schmidt has already described uh, a, a urinary isolate of actinogium uh, uh, Chalier uh, in a urinary tract uh, uh, NGS. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the organisms here. Uh, but what caught my eye in this uh, NGS group was uh, the Feingoldia magna, which has been described now uh, increasingly as a cause of viable but non-culturable uh, organisms being itself a very fastidious uh, obligate anaerobe. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, we decided to treat this patient uh, with not only an oral cephalosporin, uh, but additionally uh, oral clindamycin, and she remains on that current therapy right now with very slow uh, improvement. Um, and we can save, I think, for the uh, Q&A some discussion of some of these other organisms uh, that, uh, uh, at the least, are very unusual uh, when, when and if cultured. So to extend a little bit of this uh, second case, uh, a, uh, as I've described, a lot came up, well, which ones were we really going to treat? And uh, my rule of thumb is the less likely pathogens. Uh, you can use the, the literature and, and GenBank to help you uh, make that decision. Uh, you may even be faced with a decision of whether to do another NGS uh, on the tissue uh, using it for test of cure. Uh, of course, this has to be worked out uh, in the future of how we're going to validate test of cure with NGS, uh, but it certainly remains an option uh, for us. And the the great cautionary note here is to beware of common anaerobic pathogens, which in fact uh, may not uh, may not grow, may not be isolated, and will be uh, present on NGS. So so from this uh, experience, uh, and uh, much of which been been published in the literature. Uh, is the potential clinical utility of NGS in other uh, uh, chronic infections. And I've, li I've just listed a few here uh, for your consideration. Um, and in this slide, you'll see um, a, a, a group of those uh, that include uh, chronic urinary tract infection, chronic prostatitis, chronic pneumonitis, 
in particular, uh, the ability to uh, not only isolate uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria DNA, but also to speciate those. Prosthetic joint infections, which we're going to go into a little more detail here. Culture negative endocarditis, which has already been uh, heralding this uh, uh, innovative technology. And then some unusual uh, situations, uh, particularly uh, bacterial, bacterial uveitis and bacterial endophthalmitis. It's interesting that uh, this clinical utility was uh, begun uh, several years ago by uh, a wound surgeon, Dr. Randy Wolcott, and I put this last on purpose to say chronic wound infections may be the most widespread uh, use uh, coming for NGS, uh, both in terms of uh, postoperative wound infections, uh, for uh, chronic ulcer infections, and of course for diabetic foot infections. Uh, the door is just opening to understanding with NGS uh, the panoply of organisms responsible for these wound infections. We've developed a little bit of a very short clinical algorithm uh, for your consideration. It's very straightforward, and it involves uh, the concept that you're dealing most often with chronic infections uh, at the subspecialty level, and that those already uh, had been sent for uh, culture and sensitivity, you can see in the second box. And what we're willing to say to the clinician, if you feel you have a definitive cultural material, and want to advance the treatment, this algorithm will let you do that, and then you would decide whether you had treatment success or treatment failure. Treatment failure would bring you down to the yellow box, suggesting that you should move ahead with PCR and, and, and next-gen uh, sequencing. At the same time, if that culture um, re response and, and culture I identity was you want to proceed with PCR and level two next-gen sequencing, particularly as it's applied uh, with, uh, with microgen uh, diagnostics. And from that, we hope you will derive the bacterial DNA and fungal DNA that is present along uh, with the 17 resistance genes that Dr. Schmidt has described that should uh, allow you to advance more definitive therapy. So this is kind of a, a short algorithm. I'm sure it will be expanded by uh, 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 others uh, 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 other uh, infectious disease and clinical microbiologists, uh, but it gives it gives you some hook uh, to try to get into how to decide whether NGS is going to be done, uh, whether you're doing it in your own labs or sending it out for uh, uh, for NGS determination. Well, I'd like to move now to a consideration of some data uh, that we've uh, collected from uh, uh, NextGen. Uh, and some of which will hold a, a lot of surprise for you. And we consider prosthetic joint infection kind of a sine qua non uh, of a catastrophic and costly infection that raises many more questions uh, than simple culture and simple clinical impression uh, can answer. For instance, what does become the basis of a prosthetic joint infection? <clears throat> and uh, fellow coworkers at, uh, at the Mayo, Mayo Clinic, fellow ID physicians, Clinical microbiologists have tried to work through a, a, a definitive algorithm for that. Uh, what is the interpretation of culture negative uh, PJI? You see in the second check, and in the third, uh, how often are PJIs polymicrobial? And from the work of Javed and others at the Jefferson Department of Orthopedic Surgery, uh, we've seen now over the last four or so years in uh, peer review publications that it's probable that PJIs are more often probable uh, polymicrobial than not, which is one reason I presented the abiotrophia case, uh, just to outline the fact that occasionally you will have monomicrobial infections, albeit with unusual organisms. And then secondly, um, w w with our large uh, notation there, how do biofilms influence outcome? Do they really matter? Do they alter antimicrobial susceptibilities? And if so, uh, what portends as ideal therapy, uh, whether it be IV or oral, and can we apply some antibiotic stewardship uh, uh, to this uh, particular infection? And then finally, what does become the role of next generation sequencing in PJI? Uh, when is it done? And what are the expected results? So uh, with reference to expected results and uh, with the help of Dr. Schmidt, as we looked at these organisms, we've tried to assemble for you approximately 6,000 positive 
orthopedic specimens from the microgen database. Most of these, uh, we can't tell you exactly from prosthetic joint infections. And what you'll see is a very surprising uh, set of results. Uh, of course, these numbers are quite large because many specimens were taken in, and some in a, a cooperative study uh, that is in, in publication now and has been presented in abstract form, which you'll see in your uh, in your references, uh, uh, headed by the uh, uh, Jefferson College of Medicine Department of Orthopedic Surgery. But in this overall uh, orthopedic look, we see a huge preponderance of Escherichia coli uh, and, and, and Cardiobacterium acnes, uh, previously Propionobacterium acnes, uh, that uh, that belie what we would most often get uh, in pure culture results. Uh, we're all enamored of the staphylococci in causing uh, most often these particular PJI infections, but in fact, uh, these data suggest that it's a much more complicated uh, situation. I would bring your attention to the fifth organism down, Acinetobacter radioresistance, which was present in almost 800 of these uh, samples uh, uh, and raises the question, which I think we can discuss more in the Q&A, of whether uh, the so-called uh, speciation uh, in, uh, by biochemical identification in the clinical micro lab is in fact uh, uh, accurate and uh, how far do we have to go beyond uh, uh, DNA uh, sequencing uh, to raise the question about an organism like Acinetobacter uh, radioresistance. I will guarantee you that in this sample, uh, there were some t about 220 uh, Acinetobacter, Acinetobacter balmonii, so it's not that they were totally ignored uh, in this particular database. And then I would li leave for your perusal some of the other more interesting organisms in this uh, panoply. Uh, the other uh, equally important aspect of, of these data are that uh, uh, in more than one uh, uh, species identification, 70% uh, uh, of these organisms uh, uh, had more than one species of nucleic acid. And in, and in greater than two species, the, these accounted for 50% uh, of, of these uh, identifications. So that uh, these data would suggest, in fact, that PJI uh, and many orthopedic samples are, in fact, uh, polymicrobial. So to summarize some of the advantages we see of NGS uh, in my part of the discussion uh, is that, uh, in fact, when we look at an infection like PJI, uh, we note that many of these organisms are uh, viable uh, uh, but, but not culturable, uh, and that uh, NGS allow us, allows us to detect minor uh, and, and possibly pathogenic populations. at 24 to 72 hours uh, uh, initially for PJI and then secondly, I'm sorry, initially for PCR and then secondly uh, for NGS after receipt uh, of the specimen. And that based on uh, a huge, uh, greater than 40,000 uh, library for reference, uh, there is good DNA sequence specificity, rapid detection of antimicrobial genes. And you can see these last three advantages at the bottom cost, antimicrobial stewardship, and in fact, uh, good reproducibility uh, that microgen has done with its own validation. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we hope you now appreciate the limitations to traditional microbiological cultures uh, and how many clinical specimens from chronic infection using next-gen sequencing can aid in making and help making clinical decisions. Uh, this could be at both the level of PCR uh, and NGS as you apply it to your decision matrix. And then finally, uh, there's more work that needs to be done on straight resistance gene uh, resistosome finding in these, uh, in these particular polymicrobial infections. Uh, but I think we've had some experience, for instance, in uh, 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 HIV resistance gene uh, uh, detection uh, for making this type of, of clinical decision. Uh, the next two slides will outline just some of the references for NGS that we thought uh, would be most interesting to you. And this one highlighted 
in the second slide is the abiotrophia uh, reference that I had referred to uh, uh, earlier. Earlier ability. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to both parts of, of this uh, webinar. Uh, and we'd like to turn it over now uh, to all of your questions and hopefully a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. John and Dr. Schmidt for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, which percentage of cases regarding resistance are explained by genophenol interference versus other mechanisms of resistance, which cannot be inferred from the sequence? I'll take that question and thank you for it. That is really a fantastic question. And it's a subject of active research by many clinical laboratories across the world. And in fact, some of you may have seen a really fascinating article that appeared in Nature Microbiology entitled The Rapid Inference of Antibiotic Resistance and Susceptibility by Genomic Neighbor Typing. And I think that in years to come, as the number of specimens uh, processed looking specifically for the resistome, we'll have a better clinical understanding of the significance of this. Presently, because this has not been done in a structured clinical trial format, I can't give you chapter and verse specifics of the percentage but recognize that the microbial community is actively looking at this question. And it's only through clinical laboratorians such as yourselves who begin to use next-gen sequencing and begin to evaluate the resistomes present in these complex and often polymicrobial infections will we have an understanding to be able to specifically address that question. So again, thank you for that really fantastic question. Thank you so much for that answer. Okay, the next question. How critical is the total turnaround time in diagnosing infection? How does NGS-based method help or hurt on that front? Well, I'll, I'll take John, that, that one. That for you. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a tough question and a good one. Um, as we look closer at these uh, NGS data, we realize that most of the time when we see patients in consultation, we are looking at chronic infection. Of course, there are very few truly acute infections. Uh, so the real question is, at what point in time does NGS become helpful? Uh, how early could it be used? Uh, and how effective is it at changing what Dr. Schmidt calls the value proposition? Uh, my inclination is with closed space infections. Uh, and some of this has been published on uh, cerebral spinal fluid um, about a year and a half ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, that there are, always, there are always real surprises, especially with organisms that are viable but not culturable. Um, my bias is that uh, uh, NGS at any time uh, can be useful as an infection drags on uh, for months, maybe even years, it becomes extremely useful uh, because of viable and non-culturable organisms, particularly fastidious uh, microbes like the case we saw in Feingoldia magna. So thanks very much for that question. All right, the next question is, how do you make decisions about clinically relevant versus commensal non-relevant organisms for those detected by NGS? Well, of course, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn this over to Dr. Schmidt for his uh, input as well uh, uh, by myself quickly saying, you can't. I guess that's the short answer. And the longer answer is that it is the very commensals, remembering also that Staph aureus is a commensal residing in one third of the uh, human population in the world in their anterior nares. Uh, and that, that commensal, when in a place where it's unhappy, uh, becomes a... Uh, a mega, uh, a mega war, war, war machine uh, with with uh, nine or more toxins, multiple uh, 
uh, other virulence mechanisms. So that's a commensal organism. Maybe more appropriate to the question is the ability for coagulase negative staphylococci to get within closed spaces, particularly where there's hardware uh, and cause infections. And we know that, uh, uh, that the behavior of that microorganism can be so different in that closed space uh, other than its, uh, its own uh, niche uh, that, it, that it occupies naturally as a commensal. So I think of these organisms as having uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde ability, uh, that they sit on our skin, in our nose, uh, even uh, uh, contribute to our health uh, in our colon. But once they get into closed spaces and into the bloodstream where they're very unhappy, they turn on alternative mechanisms of survival and in that deliver virulence factors to us that make, make our uh, 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 lymphokine and chemokine receptors very unhappy and turn us into uh, septic or otherwise uh, chronic infection. So that that's the short. How do you make the real decision between? I think that's where NGS comes in very handy. For instance, in our prosthetic joint infections, we often had, in 50%, we often had three or more uh, organisms, uh, often of which two were uh, coagulase negative staphylococci. So unfortunately, species does matter the difference between a staph warnii and a staph conii, and I could go on to some of the other 19 or so coagulation negative staphylococci that may infect uh, humans. So it's a, it's a, it's a clinical judgment. Um, repeat culture and repeat NGS may be helpful in pulling out those commensals that have in fact now become uh, pathogens. Uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt, would you like to say a few things there? Uh, the only thing I could add to your great explanation, Dr. John, is we cannot divorce our thinking from the patient's immune system. And in these polymicrobial infections, where oftentimes they are in a biofilm community, this is where the research and diagnostic community need a greater sense of collaboration. With each passing day, there is a new paper on the microbiome and how it's signaling the host. And we have to appreciate that this signaling and the immune consequences of what's going on in these complex infections are really the, the whole diagnostic world is at an inflection point. And we really need to consider some of the immune consequences that are going on. And it only will take a minor player to effectively upset the apple cart. And Dr. John has alluded to that in his explanation, but I think the only thing that we can do is argue for a greater sense of doing some of these limited trials at your facilities where you begin to look for infections in say the prosthetic joint or the shoulder or wherever they might be and ask the question, what is actually going on? And again, by tracking outcomes, we'll have a better understanding of the significance of the these players. And again, unfortunately, this is a big data issue. We need lots of data in order to make some of the inferences that many of you are hoping for. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough data from the overall microbial world in order to appreciate the clinical significance of it. And so, again, that's my plea is we have to begin to do this in concert with culture and the NGS. I'll turn it back to the moderator. Okay, great. Thank you so much, doctors. Okay, let's see. Next question. Can assay be applied to the tissue sections? Well, I'll just take that. That's a softball. Thank you for that. Yeah. And the answer is yes. Um, Dr. Javette Pervisi at Jefferson is routinely taking tissue samples and sending them off to Microgen for uh, next-gen analysis and PCR analysis, and he's getting answers back. And that was one of the three, uh, one of the uh, questions I raised at the beginning when assessing what specimen types can the laboratory act on? And Microgen happens to be able to process a wide variety of specimen types so you can actually get that answer for tissue. Joe, do you wanna add or we'll turn it back to the moderator for another good question? 
you know, I would just say that's a really exciting area. Be able to take pieces of fibrotic tissue from prosthetic joints and other prosthetic devices, uh, pacemaker debris, and really see organisms that you're highly unlikely going to be able to grow. And you're very curious about that about that DNA diagnosis. Okay, thank you so much. I have an another question for you. Um, we have a mycology department that is able to identify molds by microscopy, but we don't have any other in-house method. We routinely send out mold isolates that we can't identify, but it commonly takes more than a week. Can your NGS test be performed directly from the submitted isol isolates, and is it able to identify molds? The short answer is yes. All you need to do is to package up the isolate the same way you would send it off to a another laboratory, and then they will submit that for next-gen sequencing literally from the isolate that you have, and Microgen will be able to determine um, the identity of the particular fungus, or if it happens to not be a pure culture, will tell you who's there in addition to the fungi that are present. All right, I've got one more question for you. Let's see. Does the AFB panel include mycobacteria other than uh, mycobacteria tuberculosis and mycobacteria avium? The short answer to that question is again, yes. <laughs> and and it, this is a. Go ahead, Joe. I was going to say that this is a very strong suit at Microgen, and I'll do a, a, a five-second uh, case report of a lady who's had chronic, uh, uh, low country of South Carolina has a tremendous amount of non-tuberculous uh, mycobacteria. Uh, a lady presented with a long-standing history of mycobacterium avium intercellulare, which she had, quote, had for years, although on culture she had only grown it twice. Mm -hmm. On NGS of a deep sputum on her, uh, on two occasions, there was an absence of MAC. And so I think that with the sensitivity of the uh, detecting NTM uh, and the focus on only uh, mycobacterial cultures in, in pulling out these mycobacteria, we lose sight of the background bronchiectasis caused by uh, the common commensals deep in the lung uh, by the time that bronchiectasis has, uh, has occurred. Okay, thank you. Actually, I'm going to ask you one more question before we wrap up. If the NGS is available, why at first was it hard to identify the previous, previously called zombie virus as SARS-CoV-2? Why the initial reads were not able to identify it as close to SARS? You know, in the news, China was constantly using the word unknown cause of pneumonia. Why NGS was not used to detect the pathogen and finding out more, or I'm sorry, finding out the variation from the related virus families? Well, I can't answer what the Chinese clinical laboratories were doing, but again, to give China full credit, they did sequence, they were able to isolate the virus. They did publish the sequence of the virus in literally record time. And within a month, we were able to develop diagnostic tests that spread across the globe, and they were able to do it very quickly. If you look back in history, I mean, this is the probably the most rapid that we've been able to identify an offending new pathogen to the microbial world. And the Chinese do deserve a tremendous amount of credit in trying to characterize, as you say, the zombie virus. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is its sequences weren't in the database. And unfortunately, next-gen sequencing is a reference-based technology. Very similar to Maldi-Top, you're dependent upon the database that you are using, and that, of course, is a limitation of this. So that's why we rely on the research community to continue to publish their, their sequences that are appropriately annotated, and those then are added to the database as warranted. Microgen is continuously evaluating the literature for new data to update its curated database and they are constantly revising uh, 
their algorithm that they use to process the data in order to get you a diagnostic. Remember, this is not a research company. This is a diagnostic company. So oftentimes for our patients, especially from the patient's perspective, time is of the essence. And so you want you as the attending physician or the attending microbiologist want to be able to provide an answer quickly. You don't want to wait months before you get the answer. And so again, it's the transition from research to diagnostics. And diagnostics is a very jealous um, taskmaster. They, they want that answer fast. And so um, I can only defend my Chinese colleagues is in that it was only a month until they got the data. Uh, Jennifer, let me uh, pipe in there, too. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Schmidt, uh, uh, really, for a very broad uh, and insightful uh, look into that. I want, I want to stress some of the clinical aspects of, um, of, of COVID-19 uh, pulmonary infection uh, with four major points, uh, uh, all of which to the S delineation uh, for DNA diagnosis. First of all, we now know that there is a microbiome in the upper trachea, and that microbiome will highly influence the ultimate outcome in, a, uh, in what is now a new, not only new, but very novel uh, viral infection. It, it really took the Chinese a little while to realize they were uh, dealing with uh, extreme novelty uh, in this infection. Secondly, that microbiome in the uh, trachea and then eventually in the lower respiratory tract uh, in patients with altered, uh, with altered lungs, fibrotic lungs, um, that microbiome may contribute a, a co-receptor uh, agonist. Uh, for instance, uh, in a recent article in Science, the contribution of uh, random carbohydrates for the attachment of COVID-19 to, to the ACE2 receptor. So there's a lot going on in that community, which is then joined uh, uh, by, by COVID-19. Uh, 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 thirdly, the, uh, and pertinent to the, exactly to the question, the real role of bacterial superinfection in COVID-19 has not been well worked out. Uh, those of you listening, know the legacy of, of staphylococcal and pneumococcal and haemophilus, i.e. haemophilus influenzae uh, infection, super infection uh, of, of, of post-influenza post pneumonia. Uh, the analogy with COVID is not pure and not clean. We just don't know that interaction right now. And the bacterial part of, of these infections has not been well worked out. Uh, what is the relationship to ground glass appearance so common on uh, uh, CAT scans in patients with, uh, with COVID-19 uh, to the actual microbial uh, contamination of that uh, pulmonary infiltrate? Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a similar situation in, in chronic cystic fibrosis lungs where we have over the last 20 years uh, through many wonderful workers delineated uh, the microbiome and what's become uh, the pathobiome in cystic fibrosis. And that remains to be seen um, uh, in COVID-19. Uh, but since at least uh, a, a, billion, uh, a billion people will incur uh, COVID-19, I think this is the most exciting question that has been brought to the fore in many ways this morning, uh, because how does next-gen uh, sequencing uh, as it delineates uh, all the all the players in the uh, upper medial and lower, how does that interplay affect clinical outcome? And as Dr. Fauci has said, why, what is it that makes some people get better, some people be totally asymptomatic, and many people die? Uh, so with that, I, I thank everybody also for their attention. I'll turn it back to Jen. Well, thank you, Dr. John and Dr. Schmidt. Do you have any final questions for, or I'm sorry, any final comments for our audience? 
I just want to thank them for their attendance today and plead with them to begin to do studies that get published in the literature so we can have more specific answers to their many insightful questions. So thank you. One thank of our you. friends, uh, one of our friends in clinical microbiology recently commented about uh, some of these cases and how it turns upside down the, the uh, academic and clinical teaching and clinical practice in, in treating uh, human infection. And the answer is yes, it does. This is a revolutionary, uh, revolutionary technology and we're all hanging on uh, to try to understand how it's going to help us and add to that value proposition. I wanna thank all the participants as well. Thank you again, Dr. John and Dr. Schmidt, um, for your time today and for your important research. We would like to also thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Microgen Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.